I'm very pleased to be here uh, to talk a little bit about a subject that I've spent most of my professional life uh, researching and studying and, and, and working on. So uh, I hope that I'll provide you with some uh, useful information and that you'll get take, take home uh, some, some things from this. And um, uh, the way I've structured my, my presentation this morning um, is to, first of all, just say a few words about lymphoma in general. I know that, that probably all of you here have some vested interest in lymphoma and, and uh, you know, I've, I've, I know a lot about lymphoma, but I'm going to start off with just a few general points about the different types of lymphomas that we see, and then I'm going to spend most of the presentation talking about what I think are uh, the major advances that have occurred over the last few years and that are continuing to occur and influencing how we manage uh, people with lymphoma. So what is lymphoma? Uh, oh, this is... Uh, uh, a, a slide which shows that lymphomas arise from a single lymphocyte um, and um, a mutation occurs as these lymphomas um, are developing. Uh, initially, believe it or not, the, the mutation occurs or the changes occur in the bone marrow uh, where the, the, this lymphoid uh, precursor is arising from stem cells. And uh, there's probably some mistakes in some of the programming of these lymphocytes, which allow these lymphocytes uh, to, or, or cause these lymphocytes to survive and to avoid uh, certain signals that tell them to die. So that you have now a, a lymphocyte uh, that, through its differentiation in the, in the bone marrow, has a predisposition to stay alive. And then as this lymphocyte sees antigen and is stimulated to pr proliferate because lymphocytes are a part of our immune system and are, are programmed to, to see antigens and to respond to antigens and to proliferate in antigens. These cells, because of this mistake that occurred in their early bone marrow uh, life, um, continue to accumulate. They don't, they don't sort of regress after they've seen antigens. They don't uh, decrease in numbers. And then as they further differentiate in lymph nodes, they acquire additional mutations. And depending upon uh, where uh, these mutations occur in uh, the differentiation of these cells in the lymph node, you get different types of lymphomas developing. Follicular lymphoma, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, sometimes Burkitt's lymphoma, and then as the cells are more mature and differentiating towards plasma cells, if you have mutations occurring there, you can end up with lymphoplasmacytoid or Waldenstam's types of lymphomas and, and other types of lymphomas. So the point is this is a, 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 a clone that very early on, a, a single cell that something happens to it, a mutation occurs that predisposes it to avoid dying, and then these additional uh, events occur which allow it to, uh, to survive and to proliferate. And a, an important point is that this clone, as it differentiates, may acquire multiple different mutations. And you may have subclones from this original clone that develop that have different features, maybe have a ability to divide quicker or be resistant to certain types of uh, drugs or whatever. So a lymphoma, even though it arises from a single clone, the cells are actually quite different from each other, but they do arise from a single cell. So. Um, there are many different types of lymphomas, as I've sort of alluded to. Uh, there are lymphomas that uh, we call um, indolent lymphomas, a, a whole group of lymphomas that are indolent. Uh, there's the aggressive category of lymphomas. We use the word aggressive. I've always, think, I've always thought that that was a bad term to call these lymphomas, but it does give the, uh, the description that these lymphomas grow a little quicker than the indolent lymphomas. And then we have some of these other types of lymphomas which are even more, more aggressive. We call them acute leukemia like uh, uh, type of uh, lymphomas. And lymphomas, for the most part, most of the ones that we see here in North America are B, B cell, but we do have uh, lymphomas that arise from T cells as well. And these are also uh, clones that uh, have uh, mutations occur as these cells are, are, are differentiating. The differentiation process is different for, for T uh, lymphomas. And it's important for the urologist and hematologist to know exactly what type of lymphoma you have because all of these lymphomas are treated uh, somewhat differently and have different uh, natural histories. Uh, we, we, uh, many, the most common type of indolent lymphoma is follicular lymphoma. And the reason why it's called follicular lymphoma is that, it, is that 
all of you, I, th I think, can see that there are actually, when you look at a slide from a patient's lymph node with follicular lymphoma, there are all these nodules or follicles, and that's why it was called follicular lymphoma. Uh, these account for about a quarter of the lymphomas that we see. Uh, they're slow growing. We believe that these are not lymphomas that we can cure, but we have many effective uh, therapies uh, that can, that can and put these in remission, and, um, and we have a number of new drugs that are being developed for these. The diffuse large cell lymphomas, you can again see that these, these are actually made up of bigger cells. We don't see those follicles. It's actually a diffuse uh, infiltrate of these, of these cells. Uh, these also account for about 25 or 30 percent of the different types of lymphomas that we see. These are, these are the two most common lymphomas that we see in the clinic. These are fast growing. Uh, we, we try to treat these as quickly as we can. Our objective is to obtain a, a complete response. and. Um, uh, and we do have uh, a number of other, uh, a number of new drugs, and I'll be talking about them uh, that are in development for these lymphomas as well. And then the, the third major type of lymphoma that we, that we commonly see are, are Hodgkin's lymphomas. This is not as common as the other two t t categories of lymphomas. Um, these occur predominantly in younger patients. This is a different type of disease, where as I showed you before, there were, seemed to be monotonous either nodules or follicles in the lymph node biopsy or diffuse growth pattern, you can see that the cells in Hodgkin's disease are very different. Uh, there are large cells, small cells, there are, it's really a, a collection of a number of different cells that are, that are uh, uh, be responding to uh, changes in sort of like the cytokine environment that's created by uh, the so-called Reed-Sternberg cell. And this is a disease that we have very uh, many, uh, very effective treatments for. The cure rate is 85 or 90 percent, and the focus now in research here is to try to take a step back on the treatment uh, to basically make the treatment a little easier and to avoid some of the long-term potential complications uh, that have been noted to occur with some of the, the drugs we use for Hodgkin's disease. Um, there have been, this has been a very uh, gratifying field to, to be involved in and to be active in. Um, there have been uh, very significant advances in the management and outcome uh, for patients with lymphoma over the last number of years, probably more so in this disease than any other uh, uh, cancer. Um, in the lymphoma, when I first started practice a number of years ago, um, we, we, uh, we, we talked about prognosis. The prognosis for patients with follicular or endolymphoma has doubled. Uh, the survival has doubled over the last number of years. Uh, for aggressive lymphoma, the cure rate has gone up from a, a, from a, a relatively high cure rate by 10 or 12 percent. Um, and that's a significant improvement in ability to cure this type of lymphoma. Uh, for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, we now have uh, the first treatments over the last few years that have been able to improve the survival of patients with this disease and also that are able to treat patients with very um, sort of um, ref um, uh, biologically uh, refractory types of um, uh, biology. And for Hodgkin's disease, as I mentioned, uh, the, the cure rate has, has really rocketed to 85 or 90 percent, and now uh, the, the, the focus is to try to uh, reduce, some, uh, reduce some of the medications, use some targeted drugs. I'm going to show you an example of a targeted drug for, for Hodgkin's disease that may, again, reduce some of the long-term complications that have been noted to occur as part of the treatment for, for Hodg uh, in a small percentage of patients for Hodgkin's disease. So this just shows what I've been talking about, follicular lymphoma. This is data from Stanford University where they have a very large sort of uh, database on their, on their results and showing the outcome by, by, um, by decade. And uh, this is the, the survival that was noted for these patients. And you can see that uh, this curve is continually moving up. And we don't have the last decade, but it's even higher. So this is an example how, how, how uh, uh, survival has actually improved for this disease. And this is uh, an example of the aggressive lymphomas where I said we, the cure rate has improved by 10 uh, to 12 percent uh, by the use of this new form of, of chemotherapy for this disease. And why have we had uh, these improvements in the outcome? What, what are the, the, the reasons for it? Well, one is that we have um, improvements in the diagnosis. I showed you how uh, we have all sorts of different types of lymphomas. We have more precise diagnostic categories, so we know how to treat specific types of lymphoma better. Uh, and now we're even getting uh, more precision by using things such as gene expression profiling, and PET has also been an important um, uh, uh, tool that we've had for, um, 
for diagnosing and staging uh, these lymphomas. Um, we've also had new drugs, and I'm going to actually spend most of my talk talking about uh, new drugs that we have for these various types of lymphomas. Uh, and these include very exciting drugs such as monoclonal antibodies, targeted drugs, um, and immune therapies, an area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, we've also had improvements in supportive care. We have growth factors that bring the neutrophils up quicker so that patients have less likelihood of infections. We have uh, growth factors for red cells. Uh, we have better nutritional support and we have a better understanding of what kind of nutrition uh, patients with lymphoma need. Uh, we have uh, a psychosocial support and we have better ways of, of, of venous, of, of being able to access veins uh, through various types of devices that we have, which makes uh, the treatment easier for, for patients. Um, and then another very important part uh, is the multidisciplinary team. It's no one person, it's a whole team, and this is the type of uh, team that has evolved in most major cancer centers uh, across the uh, uh, North America and Europe. Uh, it's putting together various types of professionals, nurses, chemo nurses, social workers, pharmacists, psychologists, nutritionists, physicians, and even the physicians, we have medical oncologists, hematologists, we have radiation oncologists, we have surgeons, um, and uh, even the radiologist who, who helps us very, very much with, with interpretation of the many x-rays that we get on patients with lymphoma. And this, is, this multidisciplinary team is key. It's, it's, it's not going out to, your, to, a, to a local office and being treated by one person. It's the team that you see here at Sunnybrook and at cancer centers along, across uh, the world that have helped with these improvements in outcome. And of course, we're all familiar with uh, what good teamwork can do. Uh, and and uh, at this time of the year, it's, it's, it's very important to, to, rec to acknowledge the Blue Jays. Um, but this is, the, uh, this is the actual team. This is a picture that was taken a, a few years ago of uh, the team here at, at Sunnybrook, uh, which is composed of the physicians, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, nutrition people, etc. And it's, I'm sure that many of you who've, who've had treatment here have, have been involved with uh, many of these different people here. So um, that was a brief introduction on lymphomas. Uh, and now I, I want to sort of focus in on what I think are some of the key advances that have occurred over the last few years and um, that are ongoing and that are uh, in evolution because this whole field of science and medicine is a dynamic process. It's never static. It's never stable. There's always new data coming in. There's always new results and there's always new drugs and there's always new ways to, to, to manage patients that are evolving from clinical trials uh, actually that are taking place a, a, a across uh, the world. And um, um, uh, it, it's important to, um, uh, to recognize that uh, this, this, this field is continually changing. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, some, uh, some of the, uh, the new advances in biology and diagnosis. And um, this is, I think, a, 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 this, this may be, look a little complicated, certainly a very colorful slide. Uh, this is a slide that shows gene expression profiling. And what we're doing is taking RNA from a patient's lymphoma and uh, looking at what genes are expressed in this lymphoma. And actually, this is a composite data. There's actually each one of these columns uh, that you see across here represents a different patient. So we have about 120 patients here that have had this gene expression profiling that was done. These patients all have one disease. They've all had a disease called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So we think of this, or we have thought of, about this, uh, for years as being a single disease. But um, when you look at the gene, the expression of genes, and each row here represents a different gene, and the level of expression is shown here. Red means high expression, green means low expression. First thing you see here is that every lymphoma has a different, every lymphoma, each of which is called a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which we've thought of as one lymphoma, has a different expression profile. They're all expressing a different pattern of genes here. But you can clump these into a few different um, categories. And you have uh, one group of lymphomas, which are all shown along here, where there's relatively high expression of this group of genes on the top here. And uh, this is a, a type of lymphoma that we call a germinal center B cell lymphoma. It's been called that because of the type of genes, and it defines the, the cell of origin that these genes are thought to have come from. And then on this side, we have high expression of these genes, and we now call this an activated B cell. In the middle, we have one where there's really not high expression of any of these genes. And this is called a primary metastinal or type 3 type of lymphoma. So here we have three major subsets of lymphomas 
that previously we thought was one lymphoma. And uh, this is really important because it turns out that these lymphomas behave differently than these lymphomas. These have different prognoses. These respond to drugs differently. And I'm going to show you some of that data as, as we move forward. So this is an example of an advance where we have more precise diagnosis and understanding of the exact uh, biology of this type of lymphoma that is helping us understand how this lymphoma is going to behave and how it's going to respond. And we can take that one step further. That was what we call gene expression profiling. And I'm sure many of you have heard, if you walk down University Avenue, you see Princess Margaret Hospital, the rival cancer hospital, um, where they have this big sign that says personalized medicine or home of personalized medicine. Well, every cancer center around the world now is doing personalized medicine, which means gene sequencing. So you can take this one step further. You can actually sequence uh, the, every single gene in a lymphoma or in a, any type of cancer or any type of cell. And you can do this in less than a week, and it's actually become quite economical to do so. And when you do that in patients with lymphoma, and actually in patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, again, this category of lymphomas that we used to thought, think of as, have, as being one type of lymphoma, you come up with a number of different gene or clusters of genes that are mutated in the germinal center B-cell. You, um, you have these genes that are, that are abnormal commonly. I mean, every lymphoma has different genes, but these are the genes that occur in a, a subset, uh, more than 20% of the, of the patients that are actually uh, abnormal. And for the activated B cell, you have another subset of genes, and for this primary mediastinal B cell, you have another set of genes that are mutated, which are thought to be driving these lymphomas. And this is important because these mutated genes, and I'm going to show you in, in, a, in a few slides how this has been very important in understanding the, the, the mechanism that these, these, these lymphomas are, are being driven by, but these give us targets. We know that if there's a mutation, for example, of, of BCL6, and there's overexpression of BCL6 in a particular category of lymphomas, we can try to develop a drug that will reduce the amount of BCL6, and those drugs are in development. All of these drugs now, all of these genes, are the target of various drugs that are in development. And uh, the idea will then be to apply these drugs that target these mutations specifically to lymphomas that have those particular types of those particular types of mutations, and that's something that is coming. It's not here yet, but we do have examples of, for example, using certain drugs for, let's say, the activated B cell type of lymphoma. So that's another advance where we're taking it down to the genetic level. Prognostication. There's also been uh, improvements in how in, in our uh, ability to prognosticate for lymphomas. And, and every patient who has lymphoma wants to have a feeling for an idea of what their prognosis might be. So it's important to have precise ways uh, to be able to prognosticate for patients with lymphoma. But it goes one step further because if we have a category of lymphomas that has a very good prognosis, such as let's say perhaps Hodgkin's disease or types of Hodgkin's disease, we can say, okay, well maybe we can reduce the treatment to these patients and try to keep that, that prognosis you know, where it is or that outcome where it is. On the other hand, if we have patients who don't respond well to treatments and whose prognosis we can determine at the outset doesn't look that good, maybe we can strengthen their treatment or give them additional drugs or enhance their treatment to try to improve that prognosis. And actually we have trials here at Sunnybrook where we're doing exactly that. So the gene expression profiling I showed you, uh, it, it's a uh, it's important in, in helping us understand the biology. It's important in, it's important in uh, determining what, uh, what molecules we can target, but it's also important in prognosticating because if you have a germinal uh, center B cell type of diffuse large cell lymphoma, uh, your, your, uh, your, your survival curve looks like this, or your probability of survival looks like this, whereas if you have what's called an activated B cell type of lymphoma, it's not quite as good. It's still pretty good. There's still the potential to cure, but it's not, not quite as good. And that's why uh, there are new drugs being developed for activated B-cell types of lymphomas. And we've, we've had studies at Sunnybrook where we've, um, and, and at Princess Margaret, there are similar studies where um, uh, patients are getting some of these new drugs if they have this type of activated B-cell type of uh, lymphoma. Um, we do have standard, what we call prognostic indexes, and I'm sure many of you have heard of FLIPI and IPI and MIPI. Uh, these are strange names, but they are 
Uh, FLIPI stands for Folliculum Thoma International Prognostic Index. These are indexes that have been developed around the world using large databases of patients just looking at standard clinical parameters. And the cl standard clinical parameters are shown here. If you have one of these, we call them risk factors. Uh, actually, that's, that's that only one. Then your, your uh, FLIPI score is high. You only have one risk factor. It's called a low uh, risk category and your outlook is very, very, very positive of, of uh, the likelihood of, of survival. Um, on the other hand, if you have um, three or more risk factors of these risk factors, you have a high risk uh, FLIPI score and this is not quite as good as the, the low risk and this is a category of patients that we're actually, we have uh, trials where we're trying to uh, beef up the treatment here to see if we can bring this curve up to, uh, up to that curve. Imaging, PET. Well, I know all of you have heard of PET scans, um, and um, I, PET has been a big advance. Um, a PET scan uh, is particularly, a, a PET scan refers to the ability to use positron emission tomography to um, basically quantitate the uptake of glucose, of fluoral deoxyglucose, FDG. So we heard about how Cancer cells require glucose. All cells of our body require glucose. It turns out that cancer cells are hypermetabolic for, for, uh, for glucose. And we can, sh we can see how much of this glucose is being taken up by, by different cells and different tissues. And generally, uh, lymphomas uh, basically take up a lot of this FDG. And this is particularly useful in patients with lymphoma where uh, patients have enlarged lymph nodes. This is a, a figure which shows the lymph nodes of the body. This is, these are the abnormal lymph nodes. Um, and um, after treatment, the lymph nodes will often, will usually regress, but they won't maybe go down to the normal size that m most of the other lymph nodes of the body are. They're a little enlarged. And the question remains, is there active lymphoma in these slightly enlarged lymph nodes, or is that just a reflection of the uh, distorted anatomy and scarring? And one way that we can uh, determine that is by using uh, PET imaging. So this is this patient's uh, lymph node mass with this FDG and positron emission tomography. This is actually the heart and liver and spleen. This is just the normal blood pool. This is the abnormal lymph nodes. And in the situation that I showed you, uh, after treatment where you had that one abnormal lymph node which is shown here, this does not light up. So this tells us that that uh, lymph node was most likely to be scarred and not have active lymphoma in it. So that's a very useful test. Um, what, does, what does this all mean in terms of likelihood of relapse? Well, there have been many different studies which have looked at uh, PET scanning in various types of diseases, Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's. Uh, this is just a, a, a summary of some of them. I want to point out just this Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the biggest study shown in this table here. There are other studies that are done as well. And if your PET scan was negative after treatment, uh, that's a very good negative predictive uh, factor. Only four patients out of 216 actually ended up relapsing. So a negative PET scan at the end of treatment for patients with Hodgkin's disease is a very favorable prognostic marker. Whereas on the other hand, if it was positive, you can see a quarter of patients ended up uh, relapsing. So we, we can calculate what we call positive predictive powers and negative predictive powers. A negative PET scan at the end of treatment for any disease is, is always a very good negative, uh, is always a good pr uh, prognostic factor. And the likelihood of relapse is not zero. It's never zero with, with this type of scan, but it's very low. And that's, that's very good. The positive predictive power, in other words, if it's positive, does it necessarily mean that there's still lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease there? It's not perfect. In certain situations, it is pretty high. In others, it's only, you know, infers that there could be a problem there and you still have to do a biopsy uh, to, to de determine whether or not that there is a lymphoma there, but it basically narrows down the number of patients that we have to do bi uh, biopsies on. I've had many patients who have had false positive um, um, biopsies after a positive uh, a PET scan. But this is also something that has contributed to uh, the improvements in outcome that we've seen in patients with lymphoma. Um, a PET, we don't have a lot of PET scanners in the province. Uh, we can't use PET scanners for every clinical indications. Um, it's it's, it's, it's pr primarily used for evaluation of response in actually, this should say in Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
And uh, usually for patients who have these um, uh, lymph nodes that haven't quite gone down to normal. Um, it's also useful in patients with early stage Hodgkin's d disease who may be candidates for radiation therapy. We're often wondering, can we omit the radiation? And now we're, we're getting into a standard of care where if we see the PET scan negative, after uh, chemotherapy for early stage Hodgkin's disease, uh, we, we sometimes we feel it's comfortable to omit uh, the radiation in certain situations. We can use it for staging for, Ho for Hodgkin's disease uh, and, and non-Hodgkin's disease, but really only when we are confronted with early stage uh, presentation and we're wondering what, uh, who may be a candidate for radiation therapy and we're wondering if there's disease elsewhere in the body and uh, th that would upstage the patient, uh, in which case a PET scan would be uh, approved and allowed. So, um, but we do use PET scans quite frequently, um, and, uh, but, we, but we don't have free reign of, of when, we can, can we, when we can use them just because of the availability of PET scanners in, in the province. And there's an exciting new area. Um, I was at the International Conference on Malignant Lymphoma this spring in Switzerland, which is always a nice place to go to a conference. Um, but uh, this, is, uh, this is an area where um, PET imaging, but PET imaging during treatment, particularly for Hodgkin's disease, is a very important new area of investigation. And um, it, for example, if you're under treatment for, for Hodgkin's disease and you get your chemotherapy, and you have an excellent response, so excellent that a PET scan after, let's say, two or three chemos shows that everything's disappeared, can you reduce the amount of treatment that this patient will get? These, there are some results now that show that this is, looks very promising, and that's something that possibly could be done. Uh, but there are many studies now that are called risk-adapted management of either early stage or advanced stage uh, Hodgkin's disease where um, that question is, is being addressed using a PET scan after maybe six weeks of treatment. And now I'm going to spend uh, most of the time, I hope I have some time left, uh, to talk about uh, new drugs um, for, uh, for lymphoma, uh, predominantly non-Hodgkin's, uh, non but uh, I will touch upon some drugs for Hodgkin's. Um, and um, I'm going to focus on cytotoxics, targeted, and uh, immune therapy drugs. Um, but before I start, I wanted to just say a few words about clinical trials. And, um, you know, the, the, the treatments that we have now um, have all been developed through um, sequential clinical trials that have been conducted around the world. We really don't have any treatments that we use now that haven't been subject to some clinical trials. Clinical trials are, are very important. There are a number of different types of clinical trials. We call them phase one, phase two, or phase three. Phase one trials are very early trials where there's a new drug that has come out of some preclinical studies from a laboratory somewhere and where it's looking promising, but we have to determine what's the safety profile of this drug and what's the proper dose of this drug. So this is usually a phase one type of trial. It's usually a small trial. There's usually dose escalation, and it's usually, um, and, and it's usually a smaller trial. Phase two trials are trials where, uh, uh, where a uh, phase one study has been done. The safety profile has been determined to be acceptable, uh, the dose is known, and now uh, investigators are trying to figure out, well, does this some have some activity? And, and uh, very surrogate type of endpoints are used. Will lymphoma respond? What's the duration of respond? Uh, this is usually a, 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 a slightly larger trial, and it takes a little longer to do. The definitive trials are phase three trials. These are usually randomized trials. Uh, trials in this situation are often used for regulatory approval of drugs. These require uh, important endpoints, important from the point of view of patient. Will a, will a patient live longer if they get this drug as part of their treatment? Um, and sometimes, or will they stay in remission longer? These randomized trials usually require a lot of patients, minimum of about 500 patients usually, and take quite a long period of time. So you can see a new drug that comes out of a, 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 a university somewhere can take 10 years before it could possibly be approved as a, as a drug that can be used in the clinic. Trials can be single center or multi center. They can be sponsored by an investigator. We have a number of investigator sponsored trials here at Sunnybrook and uh, Princess Margaret, there are investigator sponsored trials. But they could be sponsored by a pharmaceutical company that has an important drug that they're trying to develop, or cooperative groups such as the National Cancer Institute of Canada, Cancer of Canada. We do a number of, of cooperative group trials. Every clinical trial must be approved by Health Canada before it can go forward. 
must be approved by a local IRB. These are reviewers, including uh, the public that reviews the trials and says, you know, this makes sense, this is ethical, this is safe, this is going to be done properly, and there will be a useful answer that comes uh, based upon how this trial was designed. Um, and, and the trials have to be performed in what we call good clinical practice standards, which are standards of data collection, and et cetera, and confidentiality. Um, so trials are important. I encourage patients that I look after to participate in trials whenever there is an appropriate trial for them. We, use, we, we know of the trials that are being done locally. Uh, we can make recommendations for those trials. Um, it's also possible to find trials that are being done elsewhere. Um, every center will have some larger trials that are being done in multiple different centers. And uh, so you, you can get that trial in Alberta or Ontario. Uh, but there are some trials for very special indications and very special situations that are only done at one center. And you can find out about those uh, centers through this very important website called clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I use it myself quite frequently. I, I recommend the patients use it. Um, you put in your disease or the disease that you're interested in, the situation that you're interested in, you can get a listing of every trial because every trial that's being done has to be listed in this, in this website, the, every trial that's being done in, in North America and Europe. So um, this is a very valuable resource. And it gives you contact information as well, how you could, who you can contact to get into that trial. But of course, ask your hematologist or oncologist, they'll, they'll be able to help you with this. So now let's talk a little bit about new drugs. Um, I'm going to start off with an, a new old drug. Um, and this is a, a, a category of drugs which are, we're actually decreasing in terms of, of, um, of, of, of using, or hope we're going to be decreasing in terms of using, a cytotoxic drug. Cytotoxic drugs refer to drugs that we have accumulated over the years that are nonspecific for the cancer, basically uh, drugs that are able to kill dividing cells but unfortunately are not specific for the cancer cell. They also harm normal cells. That's why we have many of the toxicities from, from chemotherapy. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about targeted drugs and immune drugs, which are more specific for the cancer. That's the exciting area, and that's where the field is, is headed, to be using those types of drugs. But this is a very important drug. This drug came out of East Germany. It was found to be very useful through, by, by scientists and, and clinicians there in East Germany. It only became available uh, when politics allowed East Germany to be part of the rest of the world. Uh, it was then, there were a number of studies that were done in North America and it was approved uh, in 2008 in the US and now it's been approved in Canada. And uh, this is a, a cytotoxic drug. It has many of the, the side effects that we know uh, are, are common with some of the chemotherapies that we use, but it is a very effective drug. This is a study for patients with indolent lymphoma that were randomized to receive either a standard uh, that has been used throughout uh, the world. Um, one of the standard treatments, we use a slightly different standard, or this bendamustine drug, that's what we're talking about here, bendamustine. Um, and uh, you can see that this survival curve, so this is the probability of survival with time, uh, this, uh, and this is actually progression-free survival, it's not overall survival, but the point is this is a dramatically uh, increased progression-free survival. Patients actually lived 70, had a median progression-free survival, so that's period of time without relapse of 70 months as opposed to uh, 31 months uh, by using this uh, drug instead of our standard drugs for indolent uh, low-grade lymphoma. Uh, in this study, there were a number of different types of lymphoma that were used, and actually you can see the survival curve is better uh, for all the different subtypes, including Waldenstrom's, marginal zone, mantle cell and follicular lymphoma, although there weren't as many patients in some of these subsets. And for example, in marginal zone lymphoma, the, the survival curves are, are different. But um, the point is that it's not significant just because there were fewer patients that had marginal zone lymphoma in this trial. But this is uh, the other important point about this drug is that it's not as toxic. The side effects aren't as great as um, with the standard therapy that we had been using. This is just shows the neutropenia. It was actually cut in half with bendamustine and rituxan as opposed to CHOP and rituxan. So that's a big improvement. And in addition, it didn't cause uh, hair loss. There was less numbness side effect or paresthesias, and it didn't cause as much soreness of the throat, and there was less infection. So it, it, it is a very good drug. It's now our standard of care drug for patients with indolent uh, lymphomas in combination with rituximab. Uh, so that's um, 
uh, an advance in the field of cytotoxic drugs. Now I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about targeted drugs and immune therapy. And this has been a, a, a basically a very important area that to some extent has been unique to lymphomas, although it, there are targeted therapies now that in, in uh, uh, a number of other cancers, breast cancer, uh, colon cancer, uh, but they've basically uh, followed uh, the lead uh, set in the, in the, in the area of, uh, in, in the field of lymphoma. And lymphomas are B cells, and they're malignancies, or they're transformed B cells. And B cells express a number of unique proteins on their surface and also inside the cell that make them a B cell. And these proteins, actually all of these proteins here, are not expressed on any other cell in the body. They're not even expressed on T cells. They're expressed on B cells, and they're also expressed on the cancers that arise from B cells or B lymphomas. So these are very specific targets that you could imagine that if you developed a target to CD20, for example, that would uh, potentially have activity against only B cells and, and B lymphomas. And that's in fact exactly what rituxin is. Many of you receive rituxin. Rituxin has been around for over a decade now. But this is one of the first examples of a, of a targeted monoclonal antibody that has really rev has, has fundamentally changed this field of lymphoma. Every chemotherapy that we use now is enhanced with rituxin. We use it for maintenance. Uh, this has been a super drug, if you can ever call anything a super drug. Antibodies um, um, are, uh, consists of proteins. Uh, this is the part that binds to the, the actual target. This is what binds to CD20. And this is the effector region of the antibody. So this is the region that helps with the killing and, uh, of the target. And uh, it, there's a number of different mechanisms where this antibody um, uh, results in killing. Um, and uh, the antibody will bind through the, uh, the, the, this region to your B lymphoma through CD20. But this region then either binds to complement or to immune effector cells which can either be polymorphonuclear cells or natural killer cells. And it's these cells that actually are responsible for killing the lymphoma cell. Um, and that's one mechanism of cell kill. Uh, I mentioned it can also bind to complement. And rituxan can also cause some direct uh, predisposition, predisposition to apoptosis or to, to killing the cell. So there's a number of different mechanisms whereby rituxan can actually kill lymphoma cells. but um, uh, studies over the years, sequential clinical trials uh, that actually we've participated in here in Princess Margaret and other centers across Canada have, sh have shown that the addition of rituxan to standard chemotherapy has improved the results, have improved the duration of the response and survival in all of these studies. So this is one of the first studies that was done. This is taking a, what was then the standard of treatment. I told you now it's bendamustine, but at that point when this study was done, it was cyclophosphamide, vincristine, and prednisone. And patients were randomized to receive either that or that and rituxan. And if you look at the duration of response, if you just received that chemotherapy, your response was about a year and a half before we felt your lymphoma would come back. When we added rituxan to that combination, it now became 32 months. So patients basically had responses that on average lasted twice as long. And then the next idea, well, if it works so well when you combine it with chemotherapy, what if you give it after chemotherapy? Because we know that most, many of these patients, most of these patients will relapse. What happens if you give it as maintenance therapy? And uh, that was done in, in a number of studies. This is one example of a study that was done. And the duration of response now lasted five years. So you go from a situation where you had a year and a half remission to a five-year remission. And this is ongoing now. Uh, going to be even longer when we use bendamustine and rituxan as our frontline therapy as opposed to CBP and rituxan. So I, I think you'd all recognize that this has been a huge advance in, in the management uh, of patients with this type of lymphoma. Um, this is um, another study that was done with aggressive or diffuse large B-cell lymphomas. I, I told you now we have germinal center B-cells and activated B-cells. Um, types of diffuse large cell. This was just done with diffuse large B cell lymphomas. At that point, we, at that time, we treated patients with just CHOP or a CHOP-like chemotherapy. Uh, and this study randomized patients to receive uh, either this chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy and radiation. And uh, the results of this trial, again, were a success. This is survival. 
uh, so survival curve, and uh, this shows a significant improvement in the uh, likelihood of survival in patients who receive rituxan as part of their chemotherapy for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, in this, uh, the other important point from this trial was that when you looked at the side effects from patients who received rituxan chemotherapy versus just chemotherapy alone, the percentage of side effects was not any different. So rituxan being a targeted agent and having the features that I told you that it just targets uh, B cells and B lymphoma cells didn't add to the toxicity. And that's a really important point. We want to start using drugs that are effective but don't um, increase the side effects. And that's what we have to offer. Um, and I'm going to show you one more example of the importance of rituxan. This is in a disease called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, this is a trial where uh, our standard treatment for this, for, for, for fit patients, and we have different ways of, we have what, what's called a Sears index, which is a complement, complicated comorbidity index, which we use. And patients who have a favorable Sears index are candidates for this type of therapy called fludarabine and rituxan. And this is a study where patients were randomized with CLL to, who were fit to receive either fludarabine and cyclophosphamide or rituxan fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. And this trial was the first example in the whole literature um, for CLL where um, there was an improvement in survival in patients who got this particular chemotherapy. So this was a big breakthrough. And now rituxan is being tried with a number of different uh, combination drugs uh, that is being used for uh, CLL. Now the problem with this particular combination treatment is shown here. This is, a, is probably the, the strongest treatment we have for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, but it also uh, has a lot of side effects. So uh, fortunately, the, the side effects were, uh, uh, were, were much the same, although there was a slight increase in, in neutropenia and infection that was seen in patients who did get rituxan and fludarabine and, and, and uh, cyclophosphamide versus fludarabine and cyclophosphamide alone. But three quarters of patients with this chemotherapy had serious adverse events. So this is not a treatment for everybody, but if you're going to use it, you're going to use it with um, rituximab. Now, the field has moved on, and um, rituximab was the first monoclonal antibody against CT20. There's now four or five uh, monoclonal antibodies that recognize CD20 and some of those other molecules I showed you on the surface, CD22, CD19. Um, and this is a, the most advanced version of uh, some of these new monoclonal antibodies. Uh, this is called GA101. Actually, that was his first name. Then it was called obinutumumab, and now it's called Gaziva. So its, it's name has changed, but it's the same molecule. And I don't know how they come up with these names, but uh, they do make it difficult for us to, to uh, spell them anyway. Uh, this antibody recognizes uh, this, an overlapping epitope of CD20. So it's recognizing almost the same part of the protein as, uh, as uh, rituximab, same, uh, same part of the, the, the CD20 molecule as rituxan. Um, but it's a type 2 antibody. So the, the bottom part of this antibody, the FC part, has been engineered to result in increased ability to uh, uh, induce antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity with those natural killer cells and uh, neutrophils that I told you about, and also to directly produce a signal that kills uh, the lymphoma cell. And um, this just shows the mechanism of activities, enhanced ADC, increased cell death because of the engineering that went on in the um, FC part of that monoclonal antibody. And this it turns out that through the initial studies, the phase one and phase two studies, this was showed particularly promising activity in uh, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And this study uh, uh, was, was uh, performed, uh, again, as a head-to-head -head comparison of uh, chlorambucil and GA101. I'm going to use GA101 because it's easier than obinutuzumab. Um, of, of chlorambucil and GA101 versus chlorambucil and rituxan, the, the previous standard of care, in newly diagnosed patients who were not fit enough to receive that FCR combination that I showed you initially. And uh, this just shows the schema of the trial. It's basically a randomized trial to receive one of the two antibodies with chlorambucil, which is what we use for patients who aren't as fit. 
And this shows the results of this trial uh, with respect to progression-free survival. And this shows that by using this new monoclonal antibody compared to rituxan, you actually have um, a significant increase in the duration of responses in patients who, who receive this, this antibody. Um, so this is a, an advance forward, and this has resulted in uh, actually approval in the United States for this drug and by Health Canada, although we don't yet have funding for it. Uh, this study is still underway in terms of the follow-up of these patients, and so far there hasn't been a big increase in the um, survival, but follow-up will continue. Um, the toxicity profile is much the same, although it does turn out that it's a little bit more difficult to infuse it, and there are more infusion-related uh, toxicities. Uh, with this, it doesn't seem to be a big problem. I want to talk about one other type of monoclonal antibody. I see only have five minutes left. Um, and this is an antibody which is taking this all one step further. So this is recognizing CD30, not CD20. CD30 is expressed on T cells, and it's expressed on Hodgkin's disease cells. But instead of relying on the patient's own immune system to kill the cells, a toxin is attached to this antibody. And this is called monomethyl or statin. The antibody is called brintuximab. Uh, and it binds to the, the cell that expresses CD30. This antibody gets internalized, the toxin gets released, and it kills the cell. And uh, this is a study from patients with Hodgkin's disease. Almost every, refractory Hodgkin's disease, recurrent Hodgkin's disease, almost every patient who got this monoclonal antibody had a response, uh, some level of response. So this, this drug is now approved for patients with recurrent Hodgkin's disease and recurrent T cell lymphomas. We've, uh, here at our center at Sunnybrook, have done studies with this. Uh, as first-line therapy for Hodgkin's disease, where we've left out one of the drugs that we think has side effects uh, in, in, in the ABVD combination, and it's a randomized trial to ABVD versus uh, ABVD minus one of the drugs with this new drug, and we've also had a trial in T-cell lymphoma. There's one other type of immune therapy I wanted to talk about. This is an area that I've done quite a bit, a bit of research in uh, myself. It's a very important new form of therapy. And this is a therapy where we're relying on the T cell itself to try to kill cancer cells. Now, T cells are meant to recognize pathogen, recognize bacteria, recognize viruses, and recognize cancers and kill them. But cancers are smart. Cancers put up defenses, and they prevent the T cells from becoming fully activated. And some of the molecules that actually mediate this inhibition of T cells have been identified, and, and they're shown here, these inhibitory receptors. And these two in particular are important because it's been possible to make antibodies that can block these receptors and result in stimulation of the T cells uh, and ability to, to kill the cancer. And, and these drugs uh, are actually are, are becoming very important in oncology in general. These have now been approved in melanoma and lung cancer. There's been a study that was reported at this meeting, I told you, in beautiful Switzerland, um, where uh, the response rate was 87% in patients with Hodgkin's disease, who again were refractory, and also in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma that had failed other treatments. So this is a drug that we're very excited about. will be combined, as I've shown you some of these other drugs are, with standard of care treatments, and we think it's, it's very promising. And the last bit of data I'm going to show you, I know I have about one minute left. <laughs> I think I've... Um, um, is this slide here, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is meant to just sh show you that with all of this sequencing that's being done in lymphomas, w these stars represent common mutations that are found in a number of different lymphomas. So, for example, this CARD uh, CD79 uh, mutation is found in 15 or 25 percent of diffuse large B cell lymphomas. MYD88, it turns out, is found in 95 percent of patients with Waldenstrom's. But these are mutations, and these mutations result in hyperactivity of certain pathways that drive these lymphomas, that are responsible for these lymphomas. And it's now the strategy is to develop drugs that will overcome the hyperactivity of these molecules. And these actually have been developed. There's a number of, dif of these different drugs. These squares show the drugs that are actually in development, working on these different mutations. This uh, table here shows the four most important drugs that are most advanced now in clinical development. Ibrutinib uh, uh, tackles this uh, MYD88 or uh, BTK uh, uh, hyperactivity. It's been approved in a number of indications. Uh, Revlimid is very important. Uh, Velcade and Idelalisib, which is another very important drug uh, 
uh, which, which attacks one of those molecules that is mutated. Uh, it's being approved. We're doing trials here. I've had patients on, these, on some of these drugs on certain indications. They're not yet funded for the most part. Uh, we have to get special approval and different ways of, to fund these. Uh, but these are going to be very important. They're going to be part, as I've shown you, of combinations uh, that we're going to be using in the future. Uh, these aren't free of toxicities, but they have uh, different toxicities uh, and less severe toxicities in general. This is my second last slide. Uh, and the other, the other important point about this uh, is that these drugs have the ability to have activity in uh, biology. So this is uh, patients with CLL who have this mutation of P53 or 17P. These patients, you can see the survival curve, is not very good. It's not nearly as good as many of the other types of CLL. And, and actually, these patients hardly respond to most of the standard drugs we have. Well, drugs like ibrutinib and idilalisib, actually, studies have already shown that these patients respond as well to these drugs as these patients. So it's overcoming some intrinsic problems with the biology uh, with these new drugs. And that's very exciting. So this is the last slide. We're here, finally. Uh, there have been many clinical advances in the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Rituxan has been a key driver, and it's been systematically evaluated through ongoing clinical trials. Um, I think I, I spent a little time talking about prognostic indicators. It's really important because it helps us figure out which patients we should have in trials, and it also gives patients information, and we're getting better prognostic indicators, whether it be molecular or PET scanning. Uh, we have this, I showed you in the last few slides, this incredible understanding, increasing understanding by the ability to sequence every gene in these uh, cells of what genes are actually mutated, what they're doing to lymphoma, and now we have targets for specific drugs that can overcome the fundamental uh, abnormalities in these cells. So um, the point is that with all of this, everything is looking very promising uh, for the future for patients with lymphoma.